everyone, and welcome to Maxic Kingdom. This is your host, Max Lezebnik. Today, we're going to rank all nine of the themed lands at Disneyland Park from worst to best. Number nine, Tomorrowland. In terms of theming, Tomorrowland has seen better days. Tomorrowland was always a challenging land for the Imagineers because the future was always changing. Walt himself struggled with the concept of Tomorrowland. The original version of the land took place in the year 1986. When Tomorrowland first opened in 1955, it was basically a corporate fair of exhibitions. But after its 1967 redo, Tomorrowland really shined. It had the People Mover, Adventure Through Inner Space, Rocket Jets on the People Mover Station, and the Carousel Progress. Those have all closed since. Eventually, Tomorrowland was redone in 1998 on a very low budget. Some attractions that opened with the 1998 redo since closed, including the Rocket Rods, Interventions, and Honey I Trunk the Audience. Those were mediocre at best. In fact, both the former Interventions and Tomorrowland Theater are more or less vacant, while they do play host to movies and exhibitions from time to time. Today, the land is such a mess and is the worst in terms of theming. The one truly good thing about Tomorrowland is the great version of Space Mountain. Space Mountain is a soothing thrill and feels faster, since it's in a dark room themed to be outer space. Buzz Lightyear, Star Tours, and the Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage are fine rides, but not exactly my favorite. Buzz Lightyear is a fun, but outdated laser shooter ride. I prefer the original Star Tours over the current 3D Star Tours, where you now go to different destinations, only to exit back in Tomorrowland again. And Finding Nemo has a lot more screens than it does animatronics, and would be better in Pixar Pier than Tomorrowland. Anything Star Wars should be in Galaxy's Edge at this point. I was never much of a fan of Autopia, which reeks of gas and the cars only go 5 miles per hour. The Astro Orbiter at the entrance really seems to be more on Main Street than in Tomorrowland, and would be better in its rightful place on top of the former People Mover Station. The two restaurants in the land, particularly Alien Pizza Planet and the Galactic Grill, lack good menus and serve mediocre food. Tomorrowland is a mess that desperately needs a facelift. Number 8. Critter Country even though Critter Country isn't much of a land and only has two rides, the theming is still better than in Tomorrowland. In Critter Country, you actually feel like you're in the backwoods, rightfully on the rivers of America next to New Orleans Square. It originally opened in 1972 as Bear Country, and then became Critter Country in 1988 prior to the opening of Splash Mountain. The only real reason to go to Critter Country is for Splash Mountain. However, now that Splash Mountain is going to be rethemed to Tiana's Bayou Adventure, and is likely to be annexed into New Orleans Square, Critter Country won't be much of a land anymore. The only other attraction in the land is the rather lackluster Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. That building saw better days when it was originally the Country Bear Jamboree, which I remember fondly as a kid. It would have made more sense for Disney to build a better Pooh ride in Fantasyland like at other parks. The Hungry Bear Restaurant is an okay restaurant, but the Harper Galley Stand truly has the best food in the land. It would be very odd to see the sleepy Critter Country only have a mediocre Winnie the Pooh ride in the near future. I want to believe this will become a bayou section of New Orleans Square. Number 7. Mickey's Toontown Mickey's Toontown would have been at the bottom of this list to begin with, but this land is receiving a major overhaul that both Tomorrowland and Critter Country could benefit from. From 1993 until 2022, the only actual ride in Mickey's Toontown was Roger Rabbit's cartoon Spin. I still prefer the Fantasyland Dark Rides behind the castle over Roger Rabbit, but Roger Rabbit is still a better ride than Winnie the Pooh. It also has a nicely themed queue. However, this week, Toontown has finally received its first e-ticket attraction, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, almost exactly 30 years after the land originally opened. Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway is only the first Mickey Mouse themed dark ride to come to Disney Park. I haven't been to Walt Disney World since 2008, but I've seen videos of the ride at Disney's Hollywood Studios and I'm very excited. I'm even more excited we got a superior version of the ride including an interactive queue. I haven't done the Chip and Dale themed coaster in years, but it is very underwhelming in short. I do enjoy Mickey's house as it's a walkthrough attraction in and of itself where you can meet Mickey in the end. Besides Mickey's house, I haven't done the other walkthrough attractions like Goofy's house, Donald's boat, and Minnie's house. I'm not sure I even had any of the food in the old Toontown. I'm glad Toontown is getting some much needed TLC and finally a great e-ticket along with that. Although I'm not exactly sure why they decided to open Runaway Railway before the rest of the new Toontown was finished. The rest of the refurbished Toontown opens March 8th. Number 6. Main Street USA 
Main Street USA is a fantastic entrance to Disneyland. However, it does not have any major e-ticket attractions. It's the one land everyone has to walk through to get to every attraction at the park. Main Street is iconic, with its quaint early 1900s theming inspired by Walt's childhood in Marceline, Missouri. Right when you first enter the park, you're greeted by the iconic Main Street station with its Disneyland sign, including its population and elevation. The station is beautiful and placed on the front of the park's berm, which effectively transports you from the outside world. Several vehicles, including a horse-drawn trolley, a double-decker bus, a vintage car, and a fire engine all travel through the land, adding kinetic energy. The land is also home to the parades as well as viewing for the nighttime castle projection and fireworks shows. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln is an underrated gem on Main Street USA. When the show first debuted at the 1964 World's Fair, it was the first human animatronic and blew audiences away. I haven't done it since I was a kid. The show itself is long and slow, but the animatronic is the highlight of the show and was upgraded by a new Lincoln animatronic in 2009. Main Street includes my favorite store at the park, the Disneyland Emporium, with its many Disney souvenirs including Mickey ear hats, shirts, pins, and even more. The sets on the balconies inside the store and the animated scenes from Disney films on the Emporium's windows are so magical. Main Street has plenty to offer for food and drink. It has the Market House Starbucks, an ice cream shop, and a candy store as well as the Jolly Holiday Cafe. I really like the lattes and sandwiches at Jolly Holiday Cafe, and the Market House is a great stop for Starbucks, despite how long it takes to get your drinks. Main Street also includes the Carnation Cafe, which has a gorgeous patio, as well as one of my favorite restaurants in the park, the Plaza Inn, which has delicious fried chicken. Also in the land is the Magic Shop, a fun and unique shop selling magical but expensive souvenirs. Main Street is the perfect entry land, or scene one, to any theme park. It is extremely well themed, with very effective force perspective, making the buildings look taller than they actually are, and it's full of some of the park's best shops and restaurants as well as kinetic energy throughout the land. And the hub at the end of the land makes it easier to get from one side of the park to another, connecting Adventureland, Frontierland, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland. Number 5. Frontierland. Frontierland has a whole lot of style, but not much substance. It's quite beautiful and became more gorgeous after the railroad was rerouted and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge was built behind it. It has one of the best entrances of any of the park's themed lands with a recreation of Fort Sumter from the Civil War. You really do feel transported into the Old West. The only real ride in Frontierland is Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, which is a fantastic ride, while passing stalactites, a goat with dynamite in his mouth, the town of Rainbow Ridge, and an explosive climax. Of course, Frontierland also has the Rivers of America, which contains many attractions in one. The Mark Twain Riverboat, the Columbia Sailing Ship, Pirate's Lair on Tom Sawyer Island, and a view from the Disneyland Railroad. It also includes the Davy Crockett's River Canoes, which technically is in Critter Country. I haven't been on the Pirate's Lair on Tom Sawyer Island, so I can't say much about that. At nighttime, the island is home to the popular nighttime spectacular Phantasmic, which is filled with characters, mist screens, animatronics, fireworks, and even includes both the Mark Twain riverboat and the Columbia sailing ship. The rivers of America are gorgeous and contain many awesome animatronics, including Native Americans, foxes, beavers, mountain lions, moose, and deer. Also, Frontierland has two great restaurants for food that I like, including one of my personal favorites, the Mexican restaurant Rancho del Zacolo, which is next to Big Thunder Mountain, and the River Bell Terrace, an American restaurant which overlooks the Rivers of America. Of course, they also have the legendary Golden Horseshoe Dinner Theater, which has Western-themed live shows. While I haven't been into the Golden Horseshoe at all, I've seen the outdoor show that they perform on the balcony of the Golden Horseshoe. It's pretty loud with fake gunshots. Lastly, there's the quick-service stage door cafe behind the Golden Horseshoe Theater. Frontierland overall is a big and beautiful Western-themed land, and besides the Rivers of America, the main attraction there is Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Number 4. Adventureland While Adventureland isn't very big, it is extremely immersive. Despite its relatively small size, it really packs a bunch, including two of my favorite rides, the Indiana Jones Adventure and the Jungle Cruise. The curved path of the land from Main Street into New Orleans Square surrounded by huge trees really makes you feel like you're in the exotic jungles around the world. There may be Polynesian, African, and Indian theming, but they are all beautifully tied together thematically with seamless transition. I haven't done the Enchanted Tiki Room since I was a kid, but it is a major part of Disney history as it introduced audio animatronics to the world 60 years ago. I remember loving this animatronic birds and flowers as well as the animated tiki poles and drummers. The Jungle Cruise is a gem in the park that, despite opening with the park in 1955, feels fresh. The punny skippers driving the boats really enhance the experience. 
The jungle and animals aren't real, but feel realistic. It also got a wonderful enhancement two years ago, implementing diversity as well as the Society of Explorers and Adventurers into the land. The real star of the land here is the Indiana Jones Adventure, Temple of the Forbidden Eye. On that ride, you feel as though you're moving faster in jeeps than you really are. The sets are large and intricate, particularly the lava pit set with the stone face of Mara. You really feel like you've entered a forbidden temple in India. The effect where you duck under a boulder is one of the very best effects at any Disney theme park to date. The queue on the ride is also extremely well themed and is just as incredible as the ride itself. I'm also excited for the new Adventureland Treehouse, which will be a drastic improvement over the previous Tarzan's Treehouse. It will be more or less similar to the old Swiss Family Robinson, but even better, will have its own storyline and will tie into the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. Adventureland greatly improved with the addition of the Tropical Hideaway, which in addition to the Tiki Juice Bar, serves my favorite Disneyland treat, Dole Whip. The Tropical Hideaway connects the theme of the Enchanted Tiki Room while overlooking the Jungle Cruise, connecting the two seamlessly, and brought the Society of Explorers and Adventurers to California. The Tropical Hideaway is one of my favorite restaurants in the park, not just for the theming, Rosita the Parrot, or the Dole Whip, but also for its delicious bao buns. I haven't actually eaten at the Bengal Barbecue, but many people love that place for its skewers. Adventureland is a fantastic original land and represents exactly what Disneyland is all about. Putting the most immersive theming and packing a bunch into a small space with a narrow path. There's no question it's one of the park's best opening day lands, only behind Fantasyland. Number 3. Fantasyland. Fantasyland is the best of the park's opening day lands. It is the heart of the park, starting at the moat in front of the iconic Sleeping Beauty Castle. Fantasyland is notably the most attraction-dense land in the park. The front half of Fantasyland has a whopping five legendary dark rides behind the castle alone. Peter Pan, Snow White, Pinocchio, Mr. Toad, and Alice in Wonderland. Those facades are all themed to their respective films, while blending in seamlessly to create a quaint fairy tale village. Also included in the front half are the Carousel, Dumbo the Flying Elephant's Ride, the Storybook Land Canals, the Casey Jr. Circus Train, and the Mad Tea Party. Peter Pan is a classic dark ride, and the best part is that you're literally flying over incredible sets on pirate ships. My biggest complaint about this ride, however, is that it's too short with too long of a wait. Snow White's Enchanted Wish is a major improvement from when it was Snow White's Scary Adventures. The revamped attraction not only is happier and has a more cohesive ending, but is more true to the original film. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride is unique and one of the most beloved dark rides in the park. The fun of it is driving recklessly like Mr. Toad and crashing through Toad Hall and into a pub, the streets of London, explosives, a jail cell, and a train, only to end up in... heck, which is heated and full of devils. Pinocchio's Daring Journey is arguably the most underwhelming of all the dark rides, but still better when compared to Roger Rabbit and Winnie the Pooh. Though there are some nice sets, including a Pepper's Ghost Blue Fairy and a big monster animatronic. The Alice in Wonderland dark ride has only ever existed at Disneyland and is a personal favorite of mine. Riding a caterpillar, going down the rabbit hole, and into Wonderland really feels like you are in Alice's story. You also get some outdoor time before the unbirthday scene of the ride, making it extra special. Dumbo and the Mad Tea Party are two of the most iconic and well-themed flat rides in the entire world. I haven't done the storybook Land Canals or the Casey Jr. train since I was a kid, but while it isn't too exciting, it's cool seeing all those miniature sets from various Disney films. The back half of the land is more spaced out and includes the Matterhorn bobsleds, It's a Small World ride, and the Fantasyland Theater. The Matterhorn Bobsleds is a classic at Disneyland and is the first tubular steel coaster to ever open. It has two realistic Yeti animatronics scaring you as you wind down the mountain back to the base. The ride is rough when in comparison to Big Thunder Mountain and Space Mountain, but that's the beauty of it. I haven't done It's a Small World since I was a kid, and it's not my favorite ride personally. However, the facade is absolutely gorgeous and better than the ride itself. The ride has beautiful sets and great, but creepy animatronic dolls and animals, themed to different countries around the world. Disney characters now appear in respective lands based on their films. The only real restaurant in the land is the Red Rose Tavern, which was rethemed to Beauty and the Beast from Pinocchio's Village Haas. Fantasyland is a magical land, as well as the heart of the park, and of all the lands has the most rides to offer. Number 2. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge The newest land of the park gets the silver medal. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is brilliant in that, while it's part of Disneyland Park, it doesn't feel like you're at Disneyland Park. 
It's basically its own Disneyland park within Disneyland Park, going behind the berm and being immersed in your own Star Wars story. However, the black spires of Batu only enhance the neighboring Frontierland more, matching with Big Thunder Mountain and the Rivers of America. There is both a resistance forest and base connecting to Critter Country, and a First Order base connecting to Fantasyland. And then, there's the Black Spire outpost in between, connecting to Frontierland. While it's based off Star Wars, it doesn't simply recreate any destinations from the film. Instead, you're on a new planet in your own Star Wars story. Yet, there are still droids, alien species, the Millennium Falcon, stormtroopers, and a Star Destroyer. Of all the lands that did not originally open with the park, Galaxy's Edge is the largest and connects Critter Country to Fantasyland. It contains Disneyland's very best ride, Star Wars, Rise of the Resistance, which really feels like you are aboard a Star Destroyer in a galaxy far, far away. And while the trackless dark ride inside the Star Destroyer and into escape pods is breathtaking, the queue is an attraction on its own that sets up the ride's story and has its very own motion simulator ride. Rise of the Resistance is literally four, if not five, attractions in one. Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run is also fun, and in my opinion, a better motion simulator ride than Star Tours in Tomorrowland. However, I would argue that the queue is better than the ride alone. The queue really feels like you stepped on board the Millennium Falcon and includes an incredible Hondo Onaka animatronic. The Falcon really feels like you're driving and operating the beautiful piece of junk, and particularly fun if you're a pilot. However, the Falcon doesn't go to different destinations like it was originally promised, and not as fun if you aren't a pilot. The land could use more dining, but Ronta Roasters is my favorite place to eat in the land. I love those juicy Ronta wraps. Sausages and coleslaw wrapped in pita bread. I haven't been to Docking Bay 7 since the land opened, but I felt the food was just okay there. Ogo's Cantina in particular is immersive, though very expensive and has some good drinks, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. My favorite drinks at Oga's are the Jabba Juice and the Fuzzy Tan Tan. The shops in the land are some of the park's coolest stores filled with animatronics. There is a covered marketplace filled with a creature shop, Toydarian shop, and a kettle corn stand. Also, you can build your own lightsaber at Savi's workshop, build your own droid at Droid Depot, and visit Doc Ondar at his den of antiquities. Galaxy's Edge is probably the most immersive land in all of Disneyland. And you can barely see Galaxy's Edge from the rest of the park, as most of it is hidden behind the berm, while the visible black spires of Batu provide a beautiful backdrop to Frontierland. Number 1. New Orleans Square Now, for the very best land in the park in my opinion, the gold medal goes to... New Orleans Square. This was the last land that Walt Disney oversaw before he died. Not only does New Orleans Square contain two of the park's best attractions, but it also contains the park's best dining, and some of the park's best shops and theming. This land is Disneyland at its absolute best. It is not nearly as big as Galaxy's Edge, but packs so much into small space, and is placed appropriately on the rivers of America, immersing you in a 19th century New Orleans. The buildings look a lot like Bourbon Street and the French Quarter, and the paths are very narrow, just like in the real New Orleans. The entire land really puts you into that story. Pirates of the Caribbean is a Disneyland classic, and fits in thematically, since pirates were very much a big part of the founding of New Orleans. The fact that it starts in a dark blue bayou connects it to New Orleans even more. The skeleton scenes in the grotto are entertaining, but of course, the main pirate scenes are what make this attraction particularly special. From Captain Barbosa firing cannons at the fort, to the auction scene, to pirates burning the city, to the iconic jail scene. The Haunted Mansion is just as special in a different way. Like Rise of the Resistance, the story of the ride starts in the queue with its own experience. A stretching gallery that's actually an elevator down to the dark ride. You really feel like you're touring a surreal ghostly estate. From the endless hallway, to Madame Leota, to the ballroom, to the graveyard jamboree. And perhaps a ghost will hitchhike your doom buggy with you in the end. It has a walkthrough experience, projection mapping onto animatronic faces, fiber optics, and of course, the Pepper's ghost effect. New Orleans Square has the best dining of all the lands at Disneyland Park. The French Market is the park's best quick service restaurant, and I particularly love their bread bowl, corn chowder, and clam chowder. I'm personally sad to see the French Market rethemed to Tiana's Palace, but it makes perfect sense as Tiana owns a New Orleans restaurant in The Princess and the Frog. The Blue Bayou is a dining experience at the park that's not to miss, and it's inside the Pirates of the Caribbean ride's Blue Bayou scene. The Mint Julep Bar has delicious beignets and mint juleps. The beignets are my second favorite treat at the park just behind Dole Whip. Cafe Orleans has delicious Monte Cristos, both vegetarian and with ham. 
the New Orleans Square Railroad Station is also the best theme to them, with the Water Tower and Morse code translation of Walt's opening day speech, coming from its radio house. As the neighboring Splash Mountain will become Tiana's Bayou Adventure in 2024, that will likely become part of New Orleans Square. New Orleans Square is easily my favorite land at the park and is completely unique to Disneyland. It blends so seamlessly with its surrounding lands and while small, is very immersive and packs some of Disneyland's very best. Thank you for watching today! Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to Maxit Kingdom on YouTube!